Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Earlier this year, a small satellite built by Capella Space launched on a Rocket Lab Electron launch vehicle in a mission named I Can't Believe It's Not Optical, which accurately represented the many people's reactions to seeing the imagery which this satellite has been able to produce using radar, specifically a technology called Synthetic Aperture Radar. But it's actually just one of many new commercial ventures. Commercial radar satellites are being launched right now with multiple companies planning on constellations of satellites that will be able to generate Earth observation data for customers who want to pay for it. Now, there are already companies like Planet Labs which sell optically, optical imaging from space as a service. A few years ago, I took a close look at their Dove CubeSats, which can take 3 meter resolution imagery from a satellite about this size. And they can do this for the entire planet and update it on a daily basis. They also have the ability to take higher resolution imagery from other satellites on demand. But optical imagery, it relies on clear daytime skies. The radar satellites can work at night and they can work through clouds. And thanks to some clever mathematics, they can now match the resolution of optical data from similar sized spacecraft. So synthetic aperture radar isn't a new technology. It first was conceived in the 1950s, but over the years it's been miniaturized and optimized and it flew on many spacecraft. Like Magellan, for example, is one of my favorites. It went to Venus and it used its radar to penetrate the clouds and finally reveal the terrain on this planet, which never has clear skies. So I want to talk about why it's called synthetic aperture radar and to understand this you have to understand how it works. So radar, as you probably know, is a remote sensing system where you send out a radio signal and you listen for reflections of it coming back. And the timing between the signal being sent and received tells you the distance with great accuracy of the object reflecting. So classic use of this is to have a rotating radar beam so that when it points at a target, it gives you both the range and the direction based upon where the beam was pointing. So the aperture part means that it's a radar system designed for imaging, just like cameras and telescopes which have an aperture and focusing elements designed to collect imaging images using optical photons, you can do a similar thing with radar, radio photons. I mean, remember light and radio waves are both photons but with different wavelengths. Just as optical telescopes can have mirrors focusing on arrays of photosensors, you, you can make images with radio reflectors by having you know, radio reflectors and array of antenna, right? But there's a fundamental bit of physics that shows the amount of detail that you can get from an image is limited by the wavelength of the photons divided by the size of the aperture, right? So the wavelengths used in radar are usually in the range of one to 10 centimeters, while optical photons are you know, hundreds of nanometers. So the wavelengths of radio waves is like 100,000 times longer than light. And that means you need larger radio telescopes to get the same angular resolution as an optical, res optical telescope, right? Like 100,000 times bigger. The largest single radio dishes can't possibly match optical telescopes, but it is possible to use interferometry between radio telescopes thousands of miles apart to get better resolution than optical. And that's how the Event Horizon Telescope was able to construct their famous black hole image. It isn't possible to do that kind of interferometry with uh, optical images yet. So anyway, the requirement for a large antenna to get high resolution is a problem if you want to put your radar imaging system on a spacecraft or a satellite where the size is limited. So, synthetic aperture radar tries to get high resolution with a small antenna by moving that antenna over long distances and combining all the viewpoints into a single radar image with an effective aperture that's much larger, using the motion of that antenna to create a larger aperture. So synthetic aperture radar systems fly over terrain either on an aircraft or on satellites and they synthesize radar responses to create detailed images. Okay, so now you know what SAR means, how does it actually work? Well, we have a vessel, either an aircraft or a spacecraft, carrying the radar over a surface. 
The radar is pointed sideways and downwards so that it covers a patch of the surface. As the radar pulses are emitted, they reflect upon surface features on this flat surface, and the reflections are picked up by the antenna as it returns to the satellite. Now, because the radar beam is covering a finite section of the surface at an angle, objects on one side of the patch may be closer to objects on the other side, and therefore the reflections will come at different times. Now, to be clear, it's a common misconception that satellite radar mapping systems point the radar straight down underneath the satellite, but that doesn't work because you need to have a different time from different parts of your patch, and if you point it straight down, they all come back at the same time. So we know the distance to a feature on the landscape, but the radar beam is a finite width. I mean, remember, to focus radio waves, you need a large antenna, and that applies to whether you're receiving or to broadcasting. So you can draw an imaginary equidistant line on this flat surface where the object could be inside that radio beam. Uh, we need to approximate the shape of the surface, of course. You know, for aircraft, you assume it's flat. For satellites, you have to at least account for the curvature of the planet. So as the vessel is carrying the radar across the landscape, the distance to each radar return will change. It'll start further away and it'll decrease towards a minima when it's closest, and then it'll start increasing before it moves outside of the radio beam. So this curve is called the range migration curve. And since we know the motion of the antenna and the shape of the surface, we can figure out exactly where the reflection should be on that surface. And of course, this can work for multiple radar reflections just fine. And this is an example I made. I have a circle of reflectors, and when the antenna moves by, the reflected pulse timings change, showing all these different nice curves uh, and for each reflection, we can then build up the probability of the object in the area we're covering, you know, and draw this out as a sort of probability map. And when we add all these together, we get bright spots corresponding to the object. And this is a really simple piece of code. This isn't even a proper SAR implementation. Now, there's a second bit of information you can use to improve on this. Because the antenna is moving across the surface, um, the radar echoes will be shifted by the Doppler effect. So, as an object is ahead of this aircraft, the reflection will be higher frequencies, and as it is behind, the frequency will be lower. So, by looking at the frequency of the response, you can figure out the, uh, the distance ahead or behind of the vehicle and localize your, your get, make your image a whole lot better. And so you can take these radar signals and turn them into these fantastic images. Now, this involves a lot of processing power these days, and you might wonder how they did this in the past before we had computers that were able to do this. Well, some smart people actually figured out that this whole set of processing actually boils down to a bunch of Fourier transforms, and they could do this in an optical analog computer. They would record the radio signals onto photographic film, and they would use these in a facility where they would shine lasers through the film, uh, through a set of diffraction gratings and lenses, optical elements, and out the other end, all the interference patterns would boil down to the image that you actually wanted. Now, of course, these days we do all that in computer because it means you can have a lot more control about the process and tweak things without having to reshape all your lenses. Now, there are also going to be artifacts which are peculiar to the SAR processing. For example, we start by assuming that the surface is flat, and things which rise up vertically among this, that means they will be projected onto that flat surface. So that means the tops of tall objects can appear closer than they should be. This causes mountains to lean towards the viewer. This is an effect called foreshortening. And if the slope on the near side of the mountain is steeper than the angle of the illumination, the top of the mountain will actually appear closer than the base. So the detail on the slope upwards will actually be reversed. And this is a problem called layover. You also can get large objects shadowing things behind them. So you'll have black areas where you know that there's nothing or you don't know what's there. But there are ways to correct for all of this, especially if you have data from multiple angles, or if you say you use a spotlight mode where you track the thing for much longer time over multiple angles. 
Okay, so at this point, I've just been talking about things reflecting radar as simple reflectors, but the way in which things reflect is really important, and it tells us a lot about the surface. So the radar reflection depends on something called the dielectric constant, which is a, an electrical property of a substance. The higher it is, the better it will reflect radio waves. Things with a low a dielectric constant will allow the radar to penetrate down, which can be useful if you're interested in looking at things below the surface. The geometry of the surface is also critical. If a surface is perfectly flat, it reflects like a mirror, and unless that surface is oriented to reflect back at the radar, the reflection will be sent off in some other direction and not seen. A good example of this is the surface of calm water. Water has a pretty high dielectric constant, it's really good at reflecting the radio waves, and it forms flat surfaces. That means that the radar pulse is going to be reflected away from the antenna, so lakes will appear black on SAR images. This is, of course, a this reflection is also a basic principle in the design of stealth aircraft, where they reflect the ref radar away from the receiver. But natural terrain usually has a rough surface on it, and the little bumps on the surface scatter the radio pulses in all directions, producing an isotropic scattering. But the scale of those bumps in relation to the wavelength of the radar is important. If they're much larger than the radio waves, then they will reflect more like curved mirrors. If they're much smaller, then the radio waves won't scatter from them. So SAR images at different wavelengths can show different brightnesses and different properties depending upon the type of surface they're hitting. Finally, the way radio waves are reflected can depend upon the polarization of the radio waves, and it can modify the polarization of the returned radio waves as well. So the polarization is a really useful thing in SAR systems. The polarization is measured relative to the surface. It can either be horizontal or it can be vertical. And modern SAR systems will generate different pulses and they can receive both types of reflections. So, like, rough surfaces generally reflect vertically polarized radio waves more strongly. Uh, urban environments with a lot of flat surfaces mean you can get horizontal waves reflected really well. And if you have, say, thick vegetation like forests, canopies, you can see multiple reflections bouncing around and randomizing the polarization. So, you will see a change in the polarization. So this is a really useful tool for analyzing the surface. It's quite common to see false color images in SAR that use one channel for horizontal, one for vertical, and one for where the polarization was changed. And it's a really good analog for RGB color. So using all of this together now, there is a wealth of information to be gleaned from radar images. For example, we saw under the clouds of Venus to finally reveal the terrain. Cassini had a radar, and it used it to identify hydrocarbon lakes on the surface of Titan. On Earth, we've seen archaeological sites that were buried under sand. They've been found now thanks to subsurface reflections. We can watch the land around volcanoes as it rises and falls by millimetres as lava moves around under the ground. By observing farmland over the season, you can measure the changes due to growing crops and figure out crop yields. And hey, you can look at tank farms storing crude oil and analyze them to figure out exactly how much is being stored. And now with that, you can see why there's a number of commercial companies interested in generating this kind of data for customers. So this radar technology lets you get high resolution images using a small satellite. It works when the target is in darkness, it doesn't get stopped by clouds. Indeed, there are cases when you can use it to see through other optically opaque things like dry snow, sand, or say through the side of tents that are designed to hide vehicles. It can see through thin walls, but generally you can't see mo inside most buildings. So it's very, that's something I want to be clear. Most buildings are not penetrated enough by radar to get a useful in, uh, image. Uh, uh, that's despite what some people on the internet say. SAR does have limitations. Its resolution is ultimately going to be limited by the fact that it uses big, fat radio wave photons rather than finely detailed optical photons. It assumes 
that the motion of the vehicle is known and nothing else is moving. So if there's moving things in the scene, then they don't get captured correctly. I remember seeing some like conspiracy theorists saying that SAR was being used to track somebody as they drove around because of the strong reflection from a ring they were wearing. And this is ridiculous because it's an object smaller than the radio waves being used and it would be inside a vehicle which is a radar opaque thing and it would be moving. All of these things are what SAR fails at. But, you know, of course, there are military uses for sure, especially these days when you can take a, you know, a landscape image and then run machine learning over it to have it highlight and classify all of the parked vehicles, aircraft and ship for you. But, you know, on a civilian viewpoint, if you are a curious observer, there are already huge amounts of data from publicly funded science missions available for free. If you're interested, I suggest looking at the Alaska Satellite Facility, which archives all of this stuff. It has everything you need to begin looking at the world in a different light. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.